All right. Well, uh, last uh, video we talked about James and Galatians and First and Second Thessalonians and Paul's uh, first uh, three missionary journeys. Um, today we're going to talk about First and Second Corinthians, Romans, Acts, and Jude. Okay. So, uh, first off. This is um, the third missionary of Paul that we kind of closed off last time. So, if I can get my blinker here. Antioch is right here. That's Syrian Antioch. That's where he leaves from. I'm sorry. And then he goes up to Tarsus, over Derby, Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, way down through here to Ephesus. Now, he spends three years here in Ephesus. Okay. Then he goes up to Troas. And over to Neapolis, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, all the way down to Corinth, but then comes back up to Berea, over to Thessalonica, back up to Philippi, um, and uh, Neapolis, uh, and then over to Troas, Assos again, um, down here, through this way. Okay. Now it's important to note that. Um, he was going to go a different way to Corinth, um, but he ended up not. Um, throughout the Corinthian correspondence, and it seems like at least one of the times we'll get to. Um, so okay, this is known as the Corinthian correspondence. It's kind of complicated, but I've tried to simplify it as much as I can. So Paul founds the Corinthian church in you know uh, somewhere around fifty one or so. Um, this is on a second missionary journey, uh, Acts 18. Um, it's somewhere around 51 because uh, Galileo um, was in was in Corinth um, in 51, 52. Summer of 51, summer of 52, um, I believe. Uh, so that would date it to about 51. Um, now Paul writes Corinth a letter that, that's lost to us. We don't have that letter. And he makes reference to this in 1 Corinthians 5 9. Then the Corinthians write a letter to Paul, and he also gets reports. We read this from 111, 7 1, and 16 17. Okay? So then Paul replies, which is his second letter to Corinth. We call this 1 Corinthians. Okay? Uh, this was in about uh, 55, um, and it was delivered by Timothy. Now, uh, Paul visits Corinth while, F while in Ephesus a second time. Let me let me back up here. Okay, so he's on a second missionary journey and he stops in Ephesus for three years. He goes and visits Corinth for when he's when he's there in, in, in Ephesus. Okay, um, and then he and then he um, which he makes reference of in Second Corinthians two one and twelve fourteen. And then Paul writes Corinth a, a lost letter which he refers to as a painful letter. Okay, um, and then. Paul writes Corinth again, which is 2 Corinthians. So what we call 2 Corinthians is actually 4 Corinthians, and what we call 1 Corinthians is actually 2 Corinthians. Um, why were these letters not uh, not preserved? Why do we not have any, uh, any... I mean, I don't know. We just don't know, so I'm just going to move past that um, and let other people um, figure that stuff out. So he writes uh, 1 Corinthians, which is actually 2 Corinthians in 55, um, and then Second Corinthians, which is actually Fourth Corinthians, he writes in fifty six over over a few weeks. Okay, so then Paul visits Corinth, which he says he's going to do at the end of Second Corinthians on his third missionary journey. Um, um, in fifty seven, which is referenced in Acts twenty verse three. Yes, Acts twenty verse three. Okay, so. Here he is. He's gone along, gone along. He's here at Ephesus. He's here for three years. He sails across to Corinth for his painful trip, writes a Corinth again, a painful letter, and then writes some St. Corinthians, and then goes, goes over here to Corinth and, and then comes back around. Okay? Um, and then comes back this way. So, yeah, a lot of stuff happened in that, but that's the, that's the Corinthian correspondence there. Um, so, uh, 1 Corinthians was written by Paul. And his audience was the it was a Christian church in Corinth. Um, some other of the epistles are, are more contested, but this one not so much. Um, it was written about 55. Um, 
Um, AD, in the context, is Paul, is, Paul is resolving issues and confusion about lifestyle and worship. The pagan atmosphere is challenging the church. So basically, you've got these young Christians. I mean, the church was only founded in 51, and so then here is writing in 55. So that's only four years. They're pretty young Christians. Um, and there's just so many different things that are coming up because... The, the Greek culture around them is really start is, is is really influencing them and so there there's factions of people um, which I'll talk about in a second um, and and so they're they're just kind of their their lifestyle is just lacking and, and the worship is 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 just everywhere it's kind of chaotic it's just so many things that he needs to bring attention to. But notice that even though they are misusing the gifts of the spirit and even though they're misusing all these things, he doesn't tell them not to do it, just to do it right so kind of important um so uh corinth was wealthy it was a, it was a very wealthy city um it, they had uh, games that were similar to the olympic games um uh, pretty popular too uh it was a very large polis and had the had the traditional things of a polis you know um uh, the the um um Stadium, you know, the, the, all those kinds of things that were typical of, of a polis. Um, it, it boasted a, a temple to Aphrodite, which was, um, or Aphrodite, however you want to say that, which was on a hill kind of um, making it look like uh, the most um, obvious thing to see, the, to see from Corinth. Um, and it had a lot of sexual immorality. In fact, um, it, it became a kind of a slang to call someone a, a Corinthian girl. It was kind of like calling them a whore. Um just very strong sexual um, stuff going on there. So obviously the church would have been in influenced by those things. Um, as far as Gnosticism in these earlier epistles, once again, we don't really even know when Gnosticism really got going. It could have happened before the church officially was, while the, during the same time as the church, or maybe even after the church got going. Really, We don't really know. So a lot of times people say, oh, it was Gnosticism that, that was causing these different problems that, that have been written about. Possibly, or it could have just been the Greek atmosphere. I already kind of mentioned this. The Greek atmosphere was one of dualism, you know, um, and so as a result, uh, that Greek atmosphere, that Greek mindset, got into the people, and they started thinking, um, you know, in that dualistic fashion of the spirit is is completely good and, and the physical is is completely bad, and obviously, so there were a lot of factions. Um, just a lot of different factions going on there. Uh, besides the different religious backgrounds and all that stuff, there's also uh, philosophy um, was a big contribution, which meant that the Corinthians cared more about um, how something was said than, than the content of what was actually said. And you can definitely see that um, in in the in the different places throughout the Bible, how Corinth is is, is concerned about the way that Paul does not seem like a, a good speaker. You know, he he doesn't have the appearance right. Um, and these uh, these other people kind of do and whatnot. So um, also there's the idea of patrons, which is kind of like our welfare a little bit, I guess, kind of, eh, not really, but kind of, um, where the wealthier would kind of um, help out the not so wealthy, and then they would kind of you know go before them and um, you know kind of proclaim their wealth and whatnot. And so there there may have been some different um, um, problems going on there there with the different patrons. Um, competing with each other, um, but factions was definitely a, a big uh, contribution to uh, 1 Corinthians being written. <clears throat> so we have kind of two different spectrums uh, with the Corinthian church. There's denying the, the, the flesh and, and whatnot, and there's overindulging the flesh, okay? Asceticism and, and hedonism. Okay, so at the asceticism, which I surely hope that I'm saying that right, um, I have no idea how to say that word. Um, but on this side, they have the false sense of maturity. They have claims to special wisdom. They have advocating celibacy. You know, they have forbidding certain food and drink. They have believing in an only spiritual resurrection. They, you know, they're oh so mature and everything. And then we have these people over there, the, the uh, hedonism side, which are which are causing the issues of sexual sin, lawsuits, eating food with concern for, without concern for others, requiring pay for Christian work, drunkenness at the Lord's table, disrespect for appearance um, um, of sexual. Uh, Sexual propriety, basically um, things not looking good. Um, worse than the worship was obviously uh, chaotic. Um, so, 
So the main theme of First Corinthians is, 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 I guess, if I had to say, it would be a loving lifestyle. Um, you know, doing all these things out of love for one another, and and, and and that kind of being a guiding factor. You know, hey, you have this knowledge, but knowledge without is is kind of you know making you not so loving. Um, hey, you're taking people to lawsuits. You're you're using the gifts, and you don't really have concern for each other here. You know, so um, some difficult passages from the book. Um, verse, chapter 6, verse 12 says, um, I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. Now, the NIV ha, you know, separates like that, but the NASB, for instance, doesn't. Um, basically, what, what we're getting at here, um, like if you read the NIV, it says, I have the right to do anything as though it was something that they were saying. Okay. In the NASB, it doesn't say that. It just says, I have the right to do anything. Um, but not, but not everything, everything is beneficial. See what I mean? So, um, and the thing is, is, make sure that you understand that Paul is not saying, I can do anything I want. And Paul is not saying, um, you know, um, well, yeah, I, I have the right to do anything. He's not, he's not saying that. Um, he's more than likely just using one of their arguments to show them the other side of that. Because evidently they're they're familiar with the basic idea of Paul's teachings, but kind of lack the root with it. So um, he's not necessarily th saying that everything is is lawful, okay. Um, and even if he is saying that, it seems more likely he's just using it as an example, not so much that he's using it to say that everything is literally lawful. Um, also in eleven three, um, some people have gotten a little bit sidetracked with this. Um, he says. Uh, but I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Now, there are a few different things that, that, that we should know. First off, it is possible that he is just using um, everything that follows afterwards about the hats and whatnot um, to kind of, or head coverings or whatever, to kind of show the point about that, about um, Christ being the head of man and man being the head of Christ or woman. Um, or it's possible that he's just using that to um, show how um, there should be proper um, activities in the worship. See, the, the issue is not that, that people nowadays should wear or shouldn't wear head coverings. That's not even the issue. He, he's talking about, if you pick, go on to read it, everyone, every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head, but every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. And it is the same as having her head shaped. So there's two things. First off, is if he's saying, if he's simply using the, how people dress to point out, out the fact of, of um, Christ being the head of man and man being the head of, head of woman, then all that this means is that... Um, um, uh, man shouldn't do things in such a way that dishonors God, and and women shouldn't do such and do things in such a way where it um, covers up her head or, or dishonors her head or whatever. Um, a less likely um, solution. I, I don't really agree with that. I think what he's what he's actually saying is um, is basically just doing things. In, nevertheless, in verse 11, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman, but everything comes from God. So it seems like more, it's not so much the issue of, of should we wear hats today, um, but uh, but, what, uh, but but how we present ourselves. Okay, uh, Paul, or, or Craig Blomberg says in, in from Pentecost to Patmos, um, Paul's point almost certainly is that head coverings and corns symbolized either sexual or religious faithfulness versus infidelity. Um, so um, once again, um, don't don't miss the forest for the trees. We don't we don't have to necessarily go by a head covering nowadays. Okay, what he's more more or less saying at how this applies to us today um, is is like he says in verse thirteen: Is it proper for women to pray? like this, and just not the very nature of things, but if a woman has long hair down, down in there, then through verse 16, if anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor are the churches of God. Basically, he's just trying to talk about order, he's trying to, about, trying to talk about doing things with the right attitude. I mean, if you read through there, it kind of is, is pretty clear about what he's saying. For if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off, but if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off, 
um, or her head shaved, then she should cover her head. See, it's about how you present yourself. He's talking about presenting yourself well, especially in such a sexualized uh, culture as Corinth. Um, seems to be the kind of the idea there. Um, I don't really want to get too off topic about this, but basically, um, what I what I specifically want to mention is that head coverings are not necessarily the issue that we need to relate to today. Okay, um, I really wish I had more time to go into it, but it just it would take up too much time. In twelve one, he says, "Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed." Now remember. This is a church that misused the gifts, but what does he say? He's, he says to use it correctly. He doesn't say to stop using it. So if you have seen somebody misuse the gifts of the Spirit, do not withdraw from them. Do not be afraid of the gifts. Don't, don't withdraw from the gifts. Don't, don't be apathetic about the gifts. Still pursue after the gifts. Just use them correctly. Okay. Um, just because you're using the gifts doesn't make you more spiritual that you can gloat over your, your Christian brother or sister. And in 13.1, he says, If I speak in the tongues of men or angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Um, every, anything you do should be done in love. You know, he, he talks about in 12, the, the gifts of the Spirit, and then in 14, you know, kind of continues that vein of, of proper worship. And right in the middle of that, he has love. Because sometimes we do things and we don't really have love. I'm sure you've heard somebody give that that uh, message. I don't know if it was actually from God or not, but that message that um, you know, um, judgment and condemnation, all kinds of things. And they're just so happy that they're giving such a message. You know what I mean, and once again, do it in love or don't do it at all. Um, and then in 14:34 through 35, it says. Um, Women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for women to speak in the church. Once again, this I won't be able to get into and get into this the same as I wasn't able to get into the head coverings in 11.3, but um, there are a few things to note. He specifically says if they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home. Um, this verse, I don't have time to get into this either, but it, it's not saying women should be absolutely quiet for all time. He's saying that um, they shouldn't cause distractions. Evidently, something was happening that was causing distractions within the church, as we can deduce from him saying they should ask their own husbands at home. Um, we can't ultimately know exactly what, what that was, but we know that women were allowed to, to pray and prophesy. They were allowed to do all these other things. They were allowed to be in the church with the men. They were allowed all these different things. Um, uh, so it's it, it's very... Um, it's very um, one-sided to, to hop to the conclusion that women should not speak in church. And it's just not at all what he's saying. Uh, such a conclusion would be way too hasty and uh, not at all um, fair in, in regards to biblical studies. Um, so the main main point there is don't cause a distraction in the, in, in the, in the service. In 1529, um, it says, Now if there is no resurrection, what will those who do, uh, do who are baptized for the dead, if the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? Now, some people, like the Mormons, for instance, have gone on to build an entire doctrine off of this, saying that um, we should be baptized for the dead. Now, it's important to note that he switches ten, he, switch, he switches from going saying we do this to then what about those who do who are um, baptized for the dead? So evidently, um, he's just drawing from the pagan culture to emphasize his point. He's not. He's neither condoning nor condemning um, them doing it. But we can know that the church didn't do it from historical accounts and also from how Jesus talked about baptism and those kinds of things. I mean, John the Baptist, for instance, never took a dead person or did somebody for someone else. He said, you repent. So, um, anyways, uh, in summation, um, remember that Paul was not trying to make people Jewish in 1 Corinthians, okay? He was trying to get them to do things from the heart of the law, which is loving God and loving people. Okay, and he was trying to get them to um, interact with each other in, in a way that was that was beneficial. Okay, in a way that was beneficial, not a way that was one-sided. So when people say, "Oh, I can get drunk and there's no repercussions," well, in America, not so much. You do definitely need to be be on your guard about the things you allow in your life and. Um, the effects it has on other people. So that takes us to 2 Corinthians, um, which was also written by Paul probably around like the next year or so. Um, it was um, obviously once again written to the Christian church in Corinth. Um, so church, the church in the Corinth was growing. 
Okay, but there are some swing, um, but, but some are swaying them with the appearance, teaching, and qualifications. In other words, whereas before the pagan culture was getting into in, into them, uh, now it's kind of like this idea of of maybe Jewish thought, maybe. Um, so maybe people trying to make them into um, Judea Judaizers or something. Um, it's kind of unclear, but um, either way, they, they they seem to have be kind of causing a conflict similar to the Galatian church. Um, but don't want to get too creative with that. Some special characteristics. Um, there is no reason to doubt um, that St. Corinthians was written as St. Corinthians. Some have come to the conclusion that it should be broken up in different areas or that there's um, you know, uh, different areas that are uh, digressions or whatever, um, or that you know it's multiple letters that have been combined into one. There's no um, evidence for this, and there's... Totally, um, totally just as possible that it was written altogether. However, it seems very likely that it was written over a period of time after Ephesus. Okay, after he's traveling, he, he leaves Ephesus. Maybe he even started it before he left Ephesus. Um, but then, you know, he's writing, and be, he hears some news, and it causes him to end the letter with some harsh news. Is usually how people take it. Um, or he's just using, uh, Craig Blomberg even mentioned this, um, he's just using the tender tones to kind of soften them up, uh, to ask for the Jer uh, for the offering for the Jerusalem, and then end with the with the more severe um, tones. Uh, I I don't I don't really know. Um, I mean, all, all the different views sound you know plausible, I guess, or whatever. Um, but what's important is that it was probably written over a period of time, probably not written in like in a day, for instance. Um, maybe a few weeks or something like that. And then um, it starts off with Paul's apostolic ministry in tender tones, chapters 1 through 7. And then it goes to the offering of Jerusalem and, uh, for Jerusalem in 8 through 9, and then back to Paul's apostolic ministry in 10 through 13, but this time with tough tones. Okay, um, He mentions super apostles and that kind of stuff. So here's a breakdown of chapters 1 through 7. You can see chiasm definitely in it. Uh, confidence in his motives, confidence in the Corinthians. Sorrow for those punished, sorrow among the Corinthians. Upcoming travel plans, Travel plans. The spirit versus the letter. Christ versus Belial. Present afflictions. Present afflictions versus present glory. Um, core of ministry. Reconciliation. This seems to be the root of everything in chapters 1 through 7. Okay? In fact, probably the root of the letter. In fact, um, I even wrote on the next slide here, the main theme seems to be recon reconciliation as ministry. Um, some difficult um, passages. Um, in 11.3... Um, and I know that I'm not able to go very in-depth about this stuff. Um, just meant to be a very brief understanding of the epistles, just to kind of give you a general understanding. The best way to understand them is to study. It's the best way to understand them. Um, and just keep keep studying. Don't take this as the final step. This is simply meant to be a first step to get those people who aren't familiar with the New Testament deeper into it, okay? So I, I once again, I know that I had to skip through stuff very quickly. I'm very sorry. Um, 11.3 says, um, But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone... I'm sorry, I'll just stop there. Um, so, uh, when he says here... Um, um, in... In verse 5, it says the super apostles. Um, and then um, in 4, he says, For if someone comes to you and preaches that Jesus other than Jesus we preach, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put um, you put up with it easily enough. Um, and then so he's just going through the different things about these different super apostles and whatnot. And some people have, have can't come to different conclusions about that. Um, and uh, um, it's important that we understand that the, the super apostles are not the twelve. Okay, I know some people have. Oh, well, it could only be the twelve. Well, no. Um, Paul called himself an apostle, and he was not part of the twelve. Um, just because he uses the word apostle doesn't mean that he's calling, talking about the twelve. Um, also, there's no evidence whatsoever to sustain the argument that that Paul was at odds with the twelve. Only issue he ever had was when he and Peter got in that little bit of tiff um, before the Apostolic Council, and that was about something that actually mattered that Peter was believed, in, but he just kind of backed off of. Um, 
So um, it's important that we understand that's not the 12. Um, once again, I could go more into that, but not in this class. Um, and in 12 through 4, he says, And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. Um, now, some people have asked what about the third heaven. Um, in, in Greek thought, there was a lot of different um, levels of heaven. Some even range up to 365, I think. Um, but the more common word between 3 and 7, um, and obviously um, 3 appears to be the most common, but um, what he's saying here is the first heaven would be the atmosphere, the second heaven is the angelic and demonic realm, and the third heaven would be God's throne. Now, obviously, the Corinthians would have known this because of the, the Greek, their Greek um, context, um, so that's probably why he uses it, is just to relate to his, his audience. Um, in 12.7, he mentions the... <clears throat> excuse me... Um, the thorn in the flesh. More than likely, it is a physical element, as um, just the way he describes it. Um, obviously, we shouldn't press this too far, um, but um, rest on the conclusion of that. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Um, so it's best that we don't try and figure out what that thorn in the flesh is, but just that we understand the conclusion, the, the main idea, the implications for us, if you will. So um, that's in 56. Now, Romans is written probably around 57 or so, um, because it's written pretty close to when he's getting back to Jerusalem and whatnot. You can kind of tell, we'll kind of get into that with the change of his uh, ministry focus. Um, but he was in Jerusalem for two years um, until... Uh, Festus succeeds Felix, and that was in 59, so that dates the letter to about 57, um, and then he goes to uh, Rome, and I think he reach Rome, reaches Rome around like 60 or so, and then he's in Rome, and in the Roman um, house imprisonment, or whatever you want to call it, until 62, um, and then he, well, we'll get into that. Um, so his audience is, is Rome, but Paul did not found the Roman church. Okay, so this is the first letter that he, that he wrote to, to a church he did not found. So you can kind of see him breaking from his regular pattern. Okay, um, And also, you see him changing his... Well, I'll get there in just a second. Actually, down the special characteristics. Paul's ministry is transitioning. He's writing a church that he doesn't... Ha he didn't even have a place of founding. That, and he's hoping to go there. And he's hoping to kind of spread from the more eastern area way over to the more western area. Um, he's, he's wanting to go to Spain and that kind of area over there, to Rome and all that. Um, <clears throat> so and, and he's preparing to face Jerusalem, and, and he understands that things are getting a little bit more rocky for him. The context is the Jews, remember, the Jews were kicked out of Rome. Okay, They're now allowed to return back. This is around 54. Okay, um, And so they're... Uh, was more than likely a rift between the Gentile and the Jews in the congregations. Okay, because once again, the, the Christian church in, in, in Rome would have been largely um, um, uh, Gentile, um, which obviously argues that, that Peter probably didn't make it to Rome until after 54, um, would be my assumption, because he was Jewish and he was like the official missionary to the Jews. But anyways... Um, so a large part of why Paul wrote was probably to reconcile these two groups. Um, I made the webcam smaller, and it's still just a little bit too big. There we go. So the main theme seems to be the sinfulness of man and the implications of salvation. Okay. Some difficult passages um, start off with 1, 19 through 20. Um, and this says, since that... Um, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible um, qual excuse me, qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. Now he's going to go through a lot of different arguments, you know, for all the way from, you know, who are you to question what God does, to, um, you know, God gave them a chance, to we should still go out and preach. He's, he's I mean, he really attacks this from, thing from about a thousand different angles. Um, and he definitely doesn't just have one argument for this. But it seems a resounding issue that none have an excuse, okay? None have an excuse. Yes, we are called to go and proclaim. However, um, that none are without excuse in the fact that they did not hear the gospel, okay? Um, it also kind of hints towards the fact that none deserve the grace. See, salvation, sometimes we get the idea that salvation is uh, deserved or earned. 
neither of those things are true. Um, um, so, uh, in 3.23, he, he makes it very clear that all are sinners, Jew and Gentile. Um, the Jews, they had the law, and they still weren't able to keep, live up to it. Um, it's not about whether you could um, fulfill all the works of the law, because they didn't do it in faith. Um, they, did, they made it all about the works. Um, but once again, Paul makes it clear that even if you were to follow the law, nobody was able to follow it perfectly. Um, so then in 8.29-30, um, the Ordu Salutis, Order of Salvation, um, 8.29-30 says, For those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Um, and I'll read 32. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Um, without getting too much, um, it's important that we don't lean too far to Calvinism or Arminianism or whatever. Um, it seems very obvious that God, God predestines those uh, he knows will accept. Um, he's not saying double predestination, which says that um, God predestined everyone for their purpose. Okay, the people who are going to hell, he predestined to go to hell. The people who are going to heaven, he predestined. There's no, nobody can, nobody can change that. He's not saying that at all. Um, I can't really get into this, but the word that he uses here, it makes it pretty clear. Um, but we don't need to go to the other extreme and say that that, that God is just, you know, aloof in all this. Um, it seems very clear that yes, God does foreknow. He he predestines according to who will accept. Okay. Um, the, that obviously doesn't mean mean that Jesus didn't die for everyone. Jesus did die for everyone. Um, so um, it's just important not to get too off track with the whole predestination issue. Okay. Um, Nine thirty one through thirty two. Um, but the people of Israel who pursued the law as the way of righteousness have not attained their goal. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. Um, basically, um, without getting too much into this, Jews must be saved through Christ. You, do, you are not saved simply because you are a Jew. Okay? Um, there's been a really confused doctrine over this uh, through, for a while. Um, and actually, a little bit more of how we've confused the doctrine here from 11 and whatnot, but I'll come back to that. In 11, 25-26, it says... Um, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in, and in this way all Israel will be saved. Um, so, a few things. Israel being back in the land today isn't necessarily re relevant. That's not necessarily what he's saying. Sometime in the future, many Jews will turn to Christ, then they will get the land, and, a few, and there will be a future, future, future temple. Um, so, just a few things. First off, unity with the nation doesn't earn favor. I know some people say, "Oh, if we stand with Israel," let me give you let me give you a, a, a hypothetical situation. Let's say Israel is killing the children of Jordan and um, Saudi Arabia and Iran and Iraq. They're they're going and they're taking their kids and they're killing them. Would you still want to stand behind that? Now let, let, let's go a little bit further. America is. Funding a, a something called Planned Parenthood, which is killing children and then selling their body parts off. Okay, so do you honestly think that an immoral nation supporting another immoral nation would justify that nation just because God had called people who were Israel descendants? See, that doesn't really fit. Um, so once again, but once obviously Israel isn't doing that. I'm just using that as an example. Um, not that we need to say down with Israel or anything, but, I mean, there is a possibility that they, that, that they will lose the land again. And there is a possibility that they'll get it back again. Um, that's not even the issue. I know people talk about, what about Ezekiel? That's too much to talk about in another day, but it's not necessarily saying that saying that, that will happen. What, what he's saying is, sometime in the future, many Jews, not necessarily every single Jew in existence at that time, okay? Um, many Jews will um, turn to Christ, and when they do that, they will get the land in the future temple. This is probably talking about, I agree strongly with Craig Blomberg, this probably is talking about either the millennial reign or the new heavens and the new earth. Okay, It doesn't have to have to mean that a new kingdom is going to be established right here, right now. 
Okay, um, so we just need to be really careful about where we take this with the whole Israel thing. Um, and if Israel does something immoral, we we obviously should hold them to a standard. And once again, as I see in this next past in this next um, site here, get past nationalism. Okay, it's about God's kingdom. It's not about America. It's not about the nation of Israel so much as the people. Okay, God has a plan of salvation all along, which the Bible traces. Okay. It's not like he had to he had to come up with a plan B. He didn't have to give Jesus for the Gentiles and then keep the Jews for the, with the law. He, just no. This was God's plan all along. It's called his promise plan. Okay, it, it leads through all of history. Um, I don't really have time to get that much into it, but um, I want to recommend a book by um, Kaiser. I think it, Walter Kaiser. I think is his name called the promise plan of God. Jews still have to be saved through Jesus Christ. I mean, I just want to get this pretty firm in there. Um, and I know people talk about, well, they have their land back, so this is fulfillment of prophecy. Israel has not turned their hearts back to God. Okay, so this is not fulfillment of prophecy. It, it seems mostly irrelevant. Um, yes, they have gotten the land. They may lose it again. They may get it back again. It doesn't really matter. But what matters is when they turn to God, when they turn to God, God will, will restore them, okay? Um, and there will be a large group of Jews who are saved. Um, another solution is that um, um, the Israel that, that will be restored here in, in 25 is all believers, not so much exactly Israel. But the problem with that is that mo he's been talking about Israel as the actual ethnic people or, or religious people, Israel, you know, um, and so it seems very unlikely that he would switch like that with no indication. Okay. Um, so don't get too off topic is what I'm saying here. Um, sometime in the future, regardless of how it fits in with the rapture and all that stuff, um, which is a conversation for another day, uh, a large majority of Jews will come back to God um, and uh, that he will give them um, the land either in a metaphorical way or in a literal way, um, and there will be the future temple, kind of like maybe Re Revelations mentions. Um, obviously, don't want to go too far with that. Please don't take that too far. Uh, people have taken that way too far throughout history. Please don't. So this start here is in Jerusalem. I remember, he came back and was was in Jerusalem for just a little while. Kind of went. He went Troas, which is somewhere over here, Caesarea. Uh, I think he went into Patras. I'm not sure. And then he ended up, up in Jerusalem. Uh, well, let's just go back and look. Um, here on the missionary journey, he came back um, from Batara to, to Tyre, Ptolemais, Caesarea, Jerusalem. Okay, and then after that, um, he came. He, he was arrested in Jerusalem, and from Jerusalem, um, he was there for two years, um, and then uh, they take him up here, then here. Then side on, then up around to Myra, then down here, around here, around here, past Crete. They have their wonderful trip here, and then end up at Malta, then go up to um, Cilicia, then here, and then here, and then all the way over here where they are in Rome. And so then he's there for about two years, and um, we'll come back to that um, at his fourth fifth missionary journey. Um, so the that takes us through the events of Acts. This is where the events of Acts cease. Um, it was written by Luke, the, the guy who was with Paul. Um, there have been some other things that have risen, but nothing to dissuade us from the argument that it was written by Luke. Um, his audience who he was writing to was, um, it seems like he was writing to a man named uh, Theophilus, especially the title makes it imply, excuse me, that it was actually a man O Theophilus, um, and it seems also that it was meant to go to the early church, um, kind of be passed around. It was written in the early 60s somewhere, between 60 and 64, um, uh, and it ends with Paul in Rome. Uh, uh, you know, he's there for two years, and it kind of drops off there. Uh, the context, uh, the context is that the Christ had ascended, the church has, re had re has received the Spirit, now Luke writes a historical, theological, and literary account in Rome, or from Rome. 
uh, some special characteristics, the geographical progress of gospel. It goes from Jerusalem out. Remember, you go, go through this into the, uh, it says in Acts 1, I think it's 7, to the outermost ends of the earth. So it ends with Rome, kind of gradual spreading outward. Um, <clears throat> also, the Holy Spirit's guiding. Um, some people have said that it should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit, not the Acts of the Apostles. Since how Peter is the only real apostle that it really covers in good detail. Um, it also covers God's promise plan, the, the fact that, that, that God's continuing plan of salvation and being um, witnessed and being lived out. Um, basically, which should lead us to the conclusion that it's more than the land. It's more than the land of Israel. It's more than the law of the Old Testament, and it's, and it's more than the temple. Okay, I know a lot of Christians nowadays get really off track with this. Acts shows us that it's more than that. It even has a part in there with Peter where he says, don't let the things that I've called um, clean, don't call them unclean anymore. Um, this, is, this should be seen as Luke part two. It's very much so a part two to the Gospel of Luke. Um, uh, we also see that Christ's resurrection was a key factor in the early church. Um, but also, just because you read something in Acts doesn't mean that it's condoning it and may just be recording it. Once again, he, he did also have uh, historical intentions. And so um, sometimes we can get off topic and say, oh, he recorded it, so that means that it must be something we should follow. Well, no, not necessarily. Okay, maybe, but not necessarily. He doesn't give a whole lot of um, condoning, and I'll kind of talk about that in a second. Um, so we see Jesus founds the church, and then the Holy Spirit guides the church, kind of like a part one and part two. Um, in cha chapters 1 through 12, 24, we see the mission to the Jews. In chapter 12, 25 through 28, 31, we see the mission to the Gentiles. And then I already said how it kind of geographically, it starts in Jerusalem and just kind of spreads out. Okay, um, So the main theme is the acts of the Holy Spirit, in my opinion. Uh, diff difficult passages. I'm not going to look at anything specifically, just ask a few questions. First off, um, it seems like a lot of people have said, oh, well, there's a lot of historical loopholes, especially when we compare it to Galatians. Well, no, not necessarily. In fact, if you remember in the lesson about church history, I kind of uh, worked out um, the historical events based off of my study, Craig Blomberg, some other books that I have, um, especially that Encountering the New Testament book. Um, just look at those, and you'll see that it doesn't have to contradict. It doesn't have to contradict. Some people, oh, there's so many loopholes that it just... Completely unhistorical. It doesn't have to be. I mean, maybe if you if you you know obviously don't study it, it, it you could uh, come up with the idea that it, that it is. But there is no reason to see it as not historical um, and historically accurate. So I would say no. There are no historical loops. Um, also, he had the idea of apologetics. That is the defense of the faith. He had the idea of, of history. In fact, some people even had the idea that maybe it was written for something to do with with Paul's uh, imprisonment. Maybe, I don't know. Um, it was also written for history, um, to record the things that had happened. Um, and it was also kind of biographical in the sense that it, it followed Peter's uh, ministry and then Paul's. Um, and then also, so about the condoning or recording issue. Um, it starts off with them casting lots as the Old Testament told them to. But by the end of it, we see that the Holy Spirit is now guiding them. See, the Holy Spirit says and guides and tells and, and does all this stuff, showing that the Holy Spirit is the one who's, who's guiding the church now, not, not so much the lots. Um, also, it records, you know, the incident, I think it's like with a handkerchief or something like that, where, you know, Paul's, you know, handkerchief or whatever is, is touching people and they're getting healed. It's, con it's recording that something happened. It's not saying that every single time you have to have your handkerchief. I know, once again, Pentecostals have gotten way off, way off with that. Um, it also records Paul and Barnabas splitting, but doesn't really seem to take sides. It may be taking Paul's side. It's very hard to see. Um, but it uh, doesn't, really, doesn't really clarify. Um, so that Jude, I know this is next to Revelation, so people think that it, you know, it must be one of the last books. Uh, well, as it turns out, um, uh, no, it was probably written in the early 60s is a pretty good bit. Um, it seems like it was written before St. Peter, and I'll talk about that in a minute. The author was Jude, the brother of Christ. Now, it's not the other three Judes mentioned, okay? Um, it's not, or four, I guess. It's obviously not Judas, the guy who hanged himself. Um, so, not one of the twelve. Um... And it's also not Thaddeus, who was also called Jude or Judas. Um, and it was not called. It was not Judas Barsabbas or Barsabbas. Um, and it also was not the guy that Saul stayed with, um, 
who is also Judas or Jude. Um, so, wow, you know, a lot of different options of who it could be. None of those people. It was um, the brother of, of Christ, Jude, or half brother, um, and who, who he references himself as the brother of James. So. The audience is more than likely Jewish Christian, judging from the writing style, especially when compared to St. Peter's writing style. Um, but it, it could just be Christians, I, I guess. It seems, I'm just going to say for the sake of this, it's probably a Jewish Christian community outside of Palestine, probably. Um, maybe in Alexandria, Syria, or Asia Minor, but we really can't know for certain. Um, all that I know is that he references a, a book... Um, um, so about uh, about Moses um, was one of the apocryphal books. Um, I can't remember a whole lot from it. Um, I wish I could remember. Basically, it was a story about Moses, um, and then it was included in this other account. Uh, I really can't remember the name. Um, but anyways, um, so but once again, so they had some knowledge of this, probably. But I mean, that could have just meant that he was, you know, a Palestinian or writing from Palestine. I, um, and the things that were going on could have been Gentile and they could have been Jew. It's very difficult um, to know. It seems like it was a Hellenistic, maybe, um, thing going on there. So the context, the false teachers are condoning lawlessness. Um, seems very, uh, very Greek in its, in its thrust there. But obviously we just don't know enough to really know anything for certain about that, uh, who these people were. I know, once again, Gnosticism has been posed, but keep in mind that it's very difficult if you call everything that's Greek Gnostic. Okay, there is a very distinct difference between Gnostic thought and Greek thought, okay? I know it's very similar, but it's not the same thing. So, some special characteristics is that St. Peter and, and St. Peter 2 and Jude are, are very close. Very close. Um, so, the main theme seems to be to contend for the faith. There's, there's these things going on, and... Um, Jude is, is writing because he's concerned about the effects it's having on the church or will have on the church. Um, and then Singa Peter um, uses it later on, but we'll come back to that. Um, so then in Jude, um, verse 8, it says, now I'm not going to get too much into this, but I do want to warn because some people, sometimes Christians are known to say pretty stupid things about uh, the devil or demons or whatever. Um, you know, like trying to say things in, in their own power or strength or whatever. Oh, I have the power of the Holy Spirit, so I'm going to say a bunch of really dumb things. Well, eh, let's be careful about that. Also, some people say, oh, I don't I don't bow down to, to earthly authority. I, I only bow down to God. Well, yes, but God did establish the earthly authority, so that takes us to verse 8. In the very same way on this... Uh, um, in the very same way, on the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and heap abuse on celestial beings. And then in verse 9, he goes on to say, But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Um, Testament of Moses, that's what it's called. Um, there, there, were, there were two books. And it's, it's not really important for this, and this is too brief to really get into it. Um, so we'll just leave it at that. That and that ends up the discussion on on this. We've talked about um, First and Second Corinthians. We talked about Rome, Romans. We've talked about uh, Acts, and we've talked about um, Jude. So uh, next time we will talk. We'll pick up talking about Hebrews.